Okay. Um, first of all, can you state your full name for me and then start to tell me your background from academic all the way up to triple I? All right. I'm Alfred Fedotti. I graduated from Columbia in, uh, with a master's degree in 1947 and went immediately to work uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota for uh, Engineering Research Associates. It was a company that was funded by the Navy to apply digital computer techniques to cryptanalysis. I spent uh, three years there, uh, finally driven out by the winters and went to uh, Revington Rand where there was more hope of there being commercialization of our products. Uh, while there, I was uh, my biggest accomplishment was uh, rebuilding a prototype designed by Lauren Crossman to make it reliable and it went into production as one of the earliest uh, electronic business machines. I, uh, I'm not sure of the number. I think I said there 470, but that, that could not, that might not be correct. In any case, uh, I had, over the years, had made contact with the people at Raytheon who built a, a very large computer who, uh, for the Pacific Missile Range at a time when that was being replaced by a, uh, a big IBM machine, uh, 40 or so technical people, programmers, engineers became available and I was hired to uh, come out and try to make that into a business. And that was 1960. And uh, at that time I met Bob Waller. The company was already working on a uh, computer to uh, control the uh, 85 foot parabolic end head out in Goldstone and was using uh, technology that became known as the digital resolver. It's a sort of lost art, but uh, it did get embodied, as far as I remember, in Hewlett Packard's handheld scientific computer. Uh, the uh, introductions to uh, uh, JPL were critical to 3C West survival. There was a lot of uh, uh, planetary exploration. The uh, Man in Space program was just getting started. And we were trying to build uh, one-off systems, of which uh, my statement, I guess, would be the only jobs you get are the ones you underbid. And so finding a need for a, uh, a more useful platform, we developed a computer called the DDP-24. Uh, it became pretty much the workhorse and was the prominent mini computer of the day. Digital was better known, but I think we sold more than twice as many machines as digital. Uh, and the, the reason was that we had guessed right on the word length. It happened to be able to include in a, uh, a one address machine the uh, instruction and the address that was sufficient for orbital computations. Uh, Ed Fredkin was introduced to me by uh, our Vice President of, of Marketing and Sales, uh, Bill Wilson, uh, as, uh, well, in the first place, Ed was interested in uh, buying one of our computers, but in Bill's estimation, he was also un unusually bright about computer systems. Uh, we worked together in a consulting capacity. Ed was a consultant for 3C. Uh, the uh, project was a, uh, uh, unrequested proposal, I guess, to Livermore Labs, where we proposed building a multiprocessor machine. We'd do the hardware engineering, and uh, Livermore would do the software. Uh, after, uh, well, since it came in from left field, it, it wasn't already funded, and the, and the thrashing around, Livermore decided to do the job themselves. And a couple of years later, uh, with the usual uh, technical interaction and growth and specifications, the project was canceled. Uh, we still think that even at that time, we had a good chance of building what has now become you know, more ubiquitous in the uh, multi-microcomputers uh, that you now see. Uh, 
At that time, 3C, who was in business making uh, uh, PC board modules, equivalent to what would be an integrated circuit today, uh, decided to move the project back to headquarters. So all of our computer work supposedly was moved back there. Uh, Ed Fredkin uh, was working on the programmable film reader. And uh, at the time, uh, we thought it was better to, uh, to join Ed. So Bob and I put some money in, got the bag off his back, and uh, went to Cambridge to try to work on what became the PFR2 and the PFR3. Uh, Cambridge was a, it was a pretty crummy end of town at the time. Uh, the, uh, the, the dye factory next door, as and I think uh, Terry Togner says, we had a chocolate factory on another side. And uh, the, uh, depending on which way, the, we could tell to which way the wind was blowing mm -hmm. by what smells. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the work on the multiprocessor just died, uh, and uh, after about six months there, we realized we were running out of money uh, and uh, couldn't build the staff that we needed to complete those projects successfully. So we uh, moved the moved the group back to uh, L.A. Uh, Rehired uh, back some of the 3C engineers, and uh, worked with Livermore to uh, uh, agree with us that there were changes in the pro product that needed uh, needed funding. So I think we got another fifty or sixty uh, thousand dollars out of uh, out of Livermore, and with that and the uh, uh, having. Uh, known people available to do the engineering, we then successfully delivered the, uh, the two machines. Uh, About what year was this, and what did you call the product? It was called the Programmable Film Reader. There had been one of them built before, uh, pretty much out of uh, standard computer uh, display parts, uh, a PDP-1 and, and a display. Ed, Ed talked today at the meeting, read it, read it a 16 millimeter uh, camera, and basically did the first. And the first PFR, the one that we built, uh, did 35 millimeter. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> okay. But it was similar to the. It could do 16, 35, or. And I believe you uh, then got a second order. There was a wasn't there a second PFR one that was delivered? I think there was only. Uh, might have been. I don't recall. There was only one PFR2 that was for right. And then the PFR3 was the one where you, Bob, had to do the engineering now. Right. And the, the, there the, uh, the issue was to uh, push the CRT technology to the finest point available. We, we had uh, essentially 4,000 visible spots and the addressing was what, 32,000? 16,000. 16,000? Yeah. Well, uh, they were, most, most of them were visible, if you like. And I, I, I used to bring people in, <clears throat> should I talk? No, because I don't have enough camera. <laughs> but you'll get a chance soon. Um, about what year was it when that happened? When, when, what was the beginning of, when did Triple uh, I get founded? I was founded. Oh, okay, let me think. 1952? 53? 19? Wait, wait, no, that's not. <laughs> we, we, we joined you in 65. Yeah, okay, Triple I was founded. Judges by which child is how old. <laughs> well, uh, you can, I'll, I'll ask you that again when we put you on camera. But you joined in 65? That's right. Okay. The two of you? Uh, there were uh, 
actually, I guess four of us, uh, Terry Togner, who uh, handled administration. Uh, Doris Hyde is, uh, well, she was, my, she was secretary to all of us. Uh, she's uh, uh, gone. Uh, uh, Bob uh, and I, I guess, were the four people that joined. Uh, after we came back to Los Angeles and recruited, we brought in uh, half a dozen other people, to, uh, engineers and programmers, out of uh, out of 3C. That that all was in 65 and 66. Where was the uh, offices located then? We were split. We had offices in Cambridge, and for a while offices in Los Angeles. Well, initially Cambridge alone, and then finally offices on Olympic Boulevard in Los Angeles, uh, as well as uh, operations continuing in Cambridge. The electrical mechanical group stayed in Cambridge until somewhat later. And uh, Steve Gray uh, came out with a group. Uh, and that was, I think, af that was after the company went public. We went public, as I recall, somewhere in uh, 1968. Uh, and at that time, uh, part of the values that seen by the investor was that we had a small contract with uh, Eastman Kodak to do optical character recognition. Uh, that machine became what was later known as Graphics One. Uh, so is it, is it safe or correct to say that AAA was uh, one, of the, in, one of the first to do OCR? Uh, well, I, I'd, I'd say the AAA's contribution was to do all fonts at uh, high speed and uh, with virtually 100% accuracy. Uh, we, uh, we used artificial t intelligence techniques but realized that that only handled the easy 97%. Uh, and uh, what, what we did was to keep all the information in line, but to present to a uh, human the unreadable characters. So we, what it would appear is uh, those characters that were read with a high degree of reliability was shown on a screen with the uh, grayscale image of the unknown character. At that point, the human didn't, couldn't make much better guess than the machine as to what the graphic was, but in context was able to uh, key in the correct character. Okay. Let's stop for a second. Okay, so we were talking about uh, the optical character recognition, and they could read most of the fonts. Uh, by the time we were done, it could read anything. Uh, and the, and the, uh, the essence was the proper balancing of machine intelligence with human intelligence. Uh, and it became a very cost-effective machine uh, because of uh, not ever getting anything out of alignment. Most previous work at OCR uh, became uneconomic because uh, finding the errors, correcting them, and then getting them spl spliced back into the stream was too expensive. Uh, and we had a, a large battle with the uh, Social Security Administration over uh, use of our technology versus technology that was already proven obsolete. We lost that battle. Uh, we knew we were in trouble when visiting the uh, contracting officer and finding he was arranging his uh, uh, spaces and the whole place had been plumbed and, and power put in for the competitive machine. Uh, it uh, was a great example in uh, misuse of government funds to uh, support some past political contributor. What was the next big sort of milestone that came after? Well, we managed to sell two of those machines. Uh, the first was uh, to the Navy to reread 
uh, aircraft technical manuals. And we uh, would photographically capture all the illustrations and uh, OCR the text, uh, it then permitted them to issue updates in uh, days as opposed to uh, months. Uh, that machine was most successful in uh, forcing the aerospace manufacturers to release that information to the uh, Navy without cost. And the machine uh, hardly ever got used for its original purpose. We had a second machine that was sold to uh, the social services in England. It was put in at a uh, facility in northern England to read human handprint. And the unions in England, uh, well, first place, people, clerks in England didn't use typewriters. They basically were all very good at, at uh, block printing. So it was a, a somewhat a, a unique requirement. And the unions accepted the use of uh, uh, machined, machined uh, OCR equipment uh, because it was a one-time job. It was expanding the database for their social services in which they needed a lot more information about each individual. When that job got done, the machine sat idle. And eventually, uh, we were given a small contract to tune the, uh, the software, and it then was used to read the complete card catalog of the British Library. The card catalog being, uh, by that time, in uh, the cards being re-photographed in pages, about eight cards to a page, uh, and uh, consisting of 20 languages and 30 or 40 different fonts. Uh, but did extremely well. Uh, we then had a machine left over that was the backup machine for the two that we sold. In addition, we had a machine called Foodly, which we had developed in conjunction with uh, a few engineers at Stanford to provide the higher speed machine for the future OCR requirements. And the timing of that was at, at a time where OCR had, had, had done so badly that uh, agencies with large volumes of, of data were uh, decentralizing, sending the job out to the field to minimize the complaints that would go back to headquarters because of the, the poor quality of the data that was being stored. Just hold there for a second. Did you want to make a gesture? Well, he's having a hard time. Liver, something to Bob. Okay. Oh, a, a real, real Coca-Cola. <laughs> Sorry, do we don't have a Coke machine. All right, well, we'll watch the finish. Yeah, we'll we'll watch okay. The nice to meet you all. Thank you. Okay, Rich, you guys want to move down here? Sure. Uh, that's that's all. No, hey, yeah. Tom, thanks for making yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay, we'll get to it. While they're readjusting. Okay, everybody grab. Thank you. So the uh, the hardware for this was uh, built around a PDP-10. Uh, purchase from digital equipment. And we also had a binary image processor, which uh, uh, Ed Fredkin and Steve Gray, who are both here, uh, were the architects, uh, was about, had the same number of flip-flops as the whole arithmetic unit of the PDP-10, but the, uh, with software going back and forth between the, uh, the two arithmetic devices, we basically were able to achieve a very high quality of automatic reading. Uh, we anticipated that the uh, market would be uh, better and uh, would, that we need a, a machine with uh, higher speed and therefore funded the uh, creation of a, a super, super PDP-10, we called it Foodly, and it was uh, done by a combination of our engineers, uh, guided by uh, some PhD candidates from Stanford and one from MIT. Uh, that machine ended up uh, in our inventory and then was the one that uh, was finally built into a film reader, recorder, and used on the so-called movie project. Okay, well, since you brought that up, 
How did this uh, movie group come about? Who, who instigated it? And uh, how, who talked to who? And I had met uh, John Whitney's father in connection with some media work at MIT. Uh, and uh, based on that, uh, John Jr. came to visit me one day, uh, being pointed, to, we were pointed to him by, uh, by MIT through his father as a, as a place where there was some spare computer capacity. Uh, so uh, they came in, worked on their own, worked nights when uh, our staff was not using the machine, and we had some loose agreement, a one-page agreement, that we'd share and whatever uh, uh, benefits came out of this process. So we provide the hardware, they provide the talent. Uh, we, through them, got acquainted with what most of the uh, 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 early, the people early, early in the, in the uh, computer graphics game. And did it continue on that one page agreement? Uh, it it never justified any further <laughs> agreements. The, the business was a money loser from day one. Uh, we found that no matter how you tried to uh, uh, control the art directors, they are fundamentally uncontrollable. You had uh, sample pictures, you had them sign off on every aspect of it. Uh, when you got through, they would say, well, I really like that, we could use it, but I'd like it a little more purple or something. And so you'd end up running this machine for a whole weekend to make a short strip of film that finally got paid for. It wasn't until we began to do work for Disney where we ran into uh, legitimate uh, uh, contractual balance where the Disney artists were, we were protected from the Disney artists by Disney businessmen. And uh, we uh, successfully turned out films for uh, Disney World, the Florida uh, system, that uh, were quite impressive at the time. They, uh, I remember dandelions being blown in the wind and uh, uh, hel helicopter uh, oversights of the, of the uh, Great Wall in China. And, uh, and we had to do about seven inserts into that film all of which were done by the computer graphics group. We uh, came out of that project, I guess, financially whole. Uh, and managed then to lease the machine to uh, uh, Demos and Whitney, who'd found separate financing. And as the lease on that expired, and they were going bankrupt, uh, we uh, did a midnight requisition, brought the machine back, and eventually sold it to Pacific, uh, Pacific Title, I think. Uh, the, uh, and the, uh, the machine, uh, at that point, began to be used for uh, restoration of films. We had uh, high-resolution uh, uh, scanners. We had... Uh, high bandwidth uh, interactive displays uh, and uh, the, rec the recorder. So most of the film restoration done from Tron on out was done on that equipment with our contribution being uh, the hardware and a little bit of the basic software. But a great deal of it was Demos, Whitney, and Pacific Title. Um, you mentioned the work that was done for Disney for the Florida park. Was that post-Tron, after Tron? No, uh, no, the, that would have been before Tron. That was before Tron. So oh, wait know. a minute, excuse me, no. Uh, uh, tr Tron, uh, Tron, Tron was a one-off one -off kind of thing, uh, I'm not sure who I'm not, not sure who paid for that, but that that uh, Tron could have preceded the uh, the other work. I, I'm I'm not sure. Just wondering because I see maybe the relationship with Disney might have continued after. The, the My work. recollection was that our first knowing relationship with Disney was when we were 
brought in to do the the, the film for uh, Disney World. Okay. Do you have any uh, other recollections? You said uh, Dandelions in the Wind and uh, Great Wall of China. Uh, was it well, the Great Wall of China was done, you know, from a helicopter, and the contribution there was stuff that we didn't get involved with, which was to uh, uh, balance the cameras uh, against the vibration. So it was uh, the same producer we were dealing with was responsible for that. I can't now. I, I went to see the film, but I can't now remember uh, any of the particular scenes. Um, well, you pretty much brought us to the point where Gary and John. Uh, they, beca they became they stepchildren. <laughs> okay. Um, let's jump back, and if I could, I'd like to ask you a couple of specific questions. Sure. Um, I didn't hear you mention much specifically about pre-press, yet that's something... Pre? Pre-press. Uh, the triple I's business of providing magazines. Oh, pre-press. Oh, yeah, pre -press. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, um, can you talk me through your recollections of when that... Bit, when that uh, when the company started to, to realize that that could be a business and how that evolved into a business. Yeah, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned today at the meeting, we went from uh, reading film to using the same kind of devices for recording a film and introduced a uh, 35 millimeter uh, high resolution recorder for engineering drawings. That opportunity led us to uh, uh, provide equipment and services for republication of uh, technical manuals, which involved uh, text, obviously, many line drawings that were scanned, and now and then a photograph. And so that put us on the track of uh, integrating illustrations of both scanned and uh, photographic into uh, uh, a layout, a, a, a magazine-style layout for technical manuals. In the meantime, uh, RCA and IBM got into a head-to-head -head battle providing uh, electronic typesetters. Uh, and RCA contracted with uh, III for a small amount of money to uh, get some of our technology on uh, uh, improving the quality of the CRT image alignment and uh, spot size. So we had a, uh, a, a, an introduction to RCA. The RCA would uh, send people out to visit me every three or four months to pick our brains on what was going on in the industry. And RCA uh, made a serious uh, management blunder, which was that they had 10 salesmen who were selling uh, 10 video comps a year, and therefore if they had 100 salesmen, they could, have a, they could sell 100 a year. And they went ahead on that process, uh, leading the company to finally abandon the project. Uh, and uh, I persuaded them I was home in bed uh, with uh, some version of the flu and on the phone constantly to uh, the a retired vice president of, uh, of RCA, try to persuade him that III was the best company to pick over that product line. The uh, net result of that was that we bought a uh, I guess there were about 30 installed machines, uh, another 20 in which the key elements were already in the factory but, but unfinished, uh, about a $6 million cash flow uh, for, as I recall, $2.2 .2 million. Uh, and that shifted III from the engineering world into the photo typesetting world. Uh, bringing along introductions to people like Time Magazine, Newsweek, U.S. News World Report. And uh, that pretty much pushed the company technically. 
until we finally solved the problem of uh, being able to produce uh, photographic images in half-tone format at, a at the highest quality level required, which was Penthouse Magazine. And so uh, at one point in time, 90% uh, of the magazines in the world were produced on IIII equipment. Uh, some at R.R. Uh, Donnelly, some at a place in Jersey, Photos, Publishers Phototype, uh, and System for Axel Springer, another one in France. But anyway, overall, uh, we pretty much captured the uh, high quality and quick turnaround magazine business. About what year was it when you had that huge market share? We bought RCA in 1972. Uh, that pretty much changed the company at that time. Uh, the uh, maintenance of machines suddenly became a, uh, a profit. We, we had enough of our own machines out, plus the RCA machines, that our field service operation went from being a, a cash drain to being slightly cash positive. Uh, and almost all of our engineering work then uh, got directed at uh, publishing. So was it like 73, uh, 74 when you started to get that market share where you almost totally took over the pre-press magazine market? That's... Yeah, at the, at the time, Time Magazine, for example, uh, had to close its editorial in, on, on noon on Wednesday. Uh, we then tied together, I think they had eight manufacturing plants around the world, including one in Australia, and we were able to send everything electronically. And by sending the half tones early uh, and recognizing that they were seldom changed, that it was the text that were the last minute changes, we were able to reassemble electronically all the pages in full uh, paginated form. Uh, turn out the uh, uh, four color negatives uh, and the, uh, the closing then, then was able to take place noon on Saturday. So we were made the, the magazine that you received on Monday morning four days more current. And that was appreciated by, uh, I think we even we still do The Economist, or our equipment is still used on The Economist, uh, Newsweek, uh, US News World Report, Time. Uh, any, any weekly news magazine basically had to adopt it. And after that, it was the quality of our integrated free press image that dictated the rest of our business. Okay. Um. I'd like to get a sound bite because it was so, it sounded really good when you talked about that percentage of the business. So by the mid 70s, something like that, Triple I had, had 90% uh, of the magazine pre press business. Is that correct? I, I, our equipment was used for 90% of the pre press, right? So it was our customers providing services. Uh, Can I get that in a sentence? Like, um, Triple equipment, by that time, Triple equipment was used in about 90% of all the magazines published in the yeah, United States. Yeah, 90% of the magazines on the newsstand were produced on Triple I equipment. One more time without me stepping on you. Uh, at that point in time, uh, 90% of the magazines on the typical newsstand were produced on AAA equipment. Is there something that... Well, then, I guess uh, you know, that, that business pretty much got saturated. Uh, I think prior to, uh, in, in parallel with our doing engineering, uh, RCA had already successfully uh, produced uh, uh, telephone directories. And so uh, there were two, two markets. One was the telephone directory that you used to see at home, 
but the other was uh, the updated directory that had to be done every day. And so at that time, electronic retrieval of telephone numbers was so slow that they were still using uh, uh, what, uh, a limited number of copies that went to the telephone operators. And so that uh, was a rather large business, uh, and we continued to support that. Uh, for years, uh, we kept adding equipment and uh, had those uh, telephone companies were our customers. Great, terrific. Um, actually, I need to take a break to change battery, and I'm, I'm really uh, putting you through a long work after you've already gone for like 40 minutes. So let's take a break. Solver came to my aid, and he was able to put in essentially an hourglass correction. So we're able to take that whole database and uh, run it through uh, uh, some software that Mal did and it turned out to at least satisfy the producer. So you did get hands-on with the, the, the film group after all? I'm sorry? You, you actually got in hands-on with the film group there a little bit? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, just, you know, sooner or later you got that much activity going on, you get to pay more attention to it. You know, it uh, yeah, I, I remember that one well because that was uh, uh, really a head scratcher. You know, what are you going to do with this a, a fairly large investment? At that point, we were uh, using uh, projected grids, and uh, Art Dorinsky was uh, uh, digitizing this in, in uh, two images uh, in order to get 3D data. Uh, and all of that would have just gone out the window until Mal came along and said, oh, I can solve that. Uh, the, uh, and that, that was, I think, one of the, that was probably before Tron. Yeah. It's considered the first uh, feature film use of raster computer graphics. Uh-huh. Triple I has actually quite a few. Oh, and and uh, to some extent, it meant more to us because it was, you know, total images. Whereas Tron was a matter of uh, putting uh, light flashes onto uh, fake swords, and it uh, you know, was sort of a uh, technically trivial. We felt. Okay.